Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening friends and colleagues who are joining us from around the world. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this side event entitled Artificial Intelligence, Ethical Dimensions of the Virtual World. On behalf of the Baha'i International Community, in partnership with the Government of the United Arab Emirates and the NGO Committee for Social Development, it is a pleasure to welcome you today to this event. My name is Soraya Begheri, and I represent the Baha'i International Community to the United Nations. Today's event comes on the third day of a very interesting commission in which the role of digital technology is, both, is being both commended and questioned, a healthy approach to any innovation. One challenge we are facing today is that the speed of technological innovation has often outstripped our capacity to reflect analyze and consult on the implications of such innovation. The Baha'i International Community Statement to the Commission this year, which will be posted in the, in the chat box shortly, highlights the importance of participatory and inclusive consultation in determining the appropriate use of various technologies. Today, we hope to foster discussion of this kind in the area of artificial intelligence with a special emphasis on the ethical dimensions of its use. We often hear about the economic benefits generated by new technologies, and these are indeed important, but equally important are environmental and social dimensions that touch on key relationships with the planet and with each other. How do we balance competing needs? How do we assess merit and harm? Ethical questions such as these arise in all manner of spaces dealing with artificial intelligence. From protecting children, to ensuring just transitions, gathering market data, to measuring climate impact. Today, we have four distinguished speakers who will touch on a few questions related to their work through the ethical dimension of artificial intelligence. Among the questions, which you will now see in the chat box that we hope to analyze are, how will the business models underpinning AI need to shift to prioritize human flourishing? How can designers ensure that algorithmic outcomes are not tainted by prejudice of any kind? How can AI contribute to the well being of all humanity equally rather than disproportionately to certain parts of the world or, sec or sections of society? And finally, how can a variety of perspectives and backgrounds be brought together in decisions related to the design and use of AI? In terms of format for today, we will begin with a brief video clip, followed by four relatively brief interventions, and then a subsequent opportunity for question and answer. You're welcome to use the chat to discuss and then the Q&A box to pose questions. And of course, you're welcome to also upvote the questions of others. If there's something you wish to share orally, you can use the hand raise function and time and technology permitting, we will try to give you the floor. With that, let's turn to the brief video after which I will introduce our first speaker. Thank you. 
So to open up for us today, I would like to invite Mr. Hamad Khatar, the Director of International Partnerships at the Ministry of Interior for the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Mr. Hamad, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Soraya. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, I'm Hamad Khatar, Director of International Partnership and Ministry of Interior, and I'm pleased to be in, in this uh, panel and uh, in this session today. So to start with AI, AI by definition is an uh, innovative, transformative and a future based. With this sense of mission comes a greater responsibility to meet with the requirements of future, especially online safety, digital privacy and transparency. To reach there and prioritize a human flourishing, we need to work together, business, technology, government, policymakers, and users in a model that prioritizes ethics and the, uh, the adoption of artificial intelligence. AI solution, AI solution need to be inclusive as possible. Inclusivity does not just include minorities in and in vulnerable, vulnerable groups in developed uh, nations. It has, to, uh, it has to involve and reflects the global community. The risk of AI being designed only to serve a certain part of the world or a part of society is a real, uh, um, uh, is a real possibility. Greater awareness of the negative impacts of uh, AI, especially misinformation, uh, fake news, are a real risk that need to be clarifiedly assessed against the criteria that place a human progress as a center of a goal of the goal. And um, if we talk about a bias in artificial intelligence, there is always uh, a risk that a human bias, uh, prejudice can find their way into the, algorith into the algorithm as a part of the design process. The studies, the, uh, studies have demonstrated the bias in AI solution used for various purposes. A sentence, for example, a sentencing uh, algorithm used in Florida was, was found to flag a, uh, African-American accused as a high risk at, uh, at a twice the rate of a white accused. Similarly, AI solution used in a financial institution have shown a higher rejection rate of loan application for minority uh, applications. Uh, let's say, for example, Michael Sandel, a professor of law, uh, law at Harvard, has said AI not only replicates human biases at conference, on, on these biases, a kind of scientific credibility. So AI, uh, AI companies can conduct a risk assessment and series of tests by including an inclusive sample of people that truly reflect society from age to race to gender, etc. Conducting a, through a process of fairness, testing using a real human and setting a transparent matrix will greatly reduce the impact of marginalization and prejudice. And when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence contributing uh, to the safety and security as a uh, law enforcement representative, I think AI can play a critical role in contributing to the safety and security of, of our community. One area of uh, particular interest is the online child uh, abuse and exploitation. There has been a surge in the amount of child abuse material online, especially during the current pandemic. There are a number of solutions that have been developed. One is the Safer by Thorn, which can detect child abuse images within 99% accuracy and has allowed the takedown of nearly 100,000 pieces of such uh, content. Um, for us in UAE, uh, UAE and artificial intelligence, in UAE, we are proud to be pioneers in developing and promoting of artificial intelligence due to the establishment of the first Ministry of Artificial Intelligence in the world. The UAE is embracing the power and potential of artificial intelligence, leading calls of concern of uh, an ethical framework underpinning AI need to be accepted by more countries and organizations as a key component of business model, not an optional accessory. So the Ministry of AI is committed to enhancing the lives of those both in UAE and globally. Uh, the UAE Ministry of Interior um, has, uh, has partnered with, um, with the United Nations Interreligion Crime and Justice Research Institute, UNICRI, through its Center of AI and Robotics, 
and the Hague to explore the use of artificial intelligence to support the law enforcement uh, authorities and combating online child sexual abuse and exploitation. Children continue to be one of the most vulnerable groups in our society, especially during ongoing pandemic with a large number of children away from the schools, spending an, an increased amount of time uh, online. This project is in the nearly uh, stages, but aims to bring together a number of global stakeholders to utilize, to utilize the power of AI in uh, protecting children. And from uh, today's, um, I would like to invite every, um, every one of you, if, if you are interested to join the first stakeholder meeting that we will, we will have soon. Thank you so much, uh, Thoraya, and uh, I give you the mic. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much, uh, Mr. Hamad. Thank you. I would like to now invite uh, Ms. Elin Shivo. She's the Senior Advisor on Digital Policy for the European People's Party. Uh, Ms. Shivo, you have the floor. Thank you, Soraya. It's an honor to join this conversation. Uh, thank you to the, the Baha'i International Community for having me. Uh, I'm the European People's Party Advisor on Digital Policy and the EPP is, is Europe's largest political party. And actually I'd like to mention here that our Secretary General Antonio Lopez is to use right, right. Um, with him, through him, the party has supported the protection of the rights of the Baha'i community uh, in face of the oppression of the Iranian uh, regime. Uh, what I'd like to, to talk about is uh, as ethics uh, have entered the field of AI, uh, how ethics is not straightforward and perhaps not enough because it's tricky. And then perhaps later in the discussion, um, what can help in embedding in embedding um, uh, AI ethics in, in, in systems, why those principles matter, why they're useful, perhaps what, you know, why we may be worrying about the wrong things, uh, but also I could speak to the EU's approach and what they're doing in this space and, and what various stakeholders think of, of all of this. So the current uh, development of, uh, you know, of AI is right now in the development phase, let's say. So it remains ex exploratory and the adoption in markets is, is at an early stage and much of the capability of this technology is yet to be tapped. But there's been ethical challenges of discrimination, lack of transparency, uh, neglect of individual rights, and, and more. And that's been rising in recent years, those concerns, although they tend to emerge every time there's, of course, a new wave of innovation. And that has prompted a number of governments, uh, companies, research organizations, and, and intergovernmental organizations to craft frameworks and propose policies and, you know, as to so as to incorporate values into existing rules and, and make recommendations to address the concerns, to create trust. And, and to, to better manage the impacts of AI, but also capturing you know, the, the opportunities that the technology offers because that drives up uh, prosperity and innovation. And to achieve this, you have several tools and, and instruments that already exist, of course, like human rights frameworks or soft law, like technical standards or industry self-regulation or codes of conduct, uh, but they may not be sufficiently addressing all of the AI challenges and ethical concerns that have been rising. So that has led to hundreds of strategic um, or ethical guidelines for AI being available out there today and a multiplication of AI alliance. And that really shows how the impact of, of AI is raising uh, massive interest, but it also suggests a race to develop them. And that reflects also a lack of consensus on, on, on what could be standardized, accepted high level principles and codes of conduct, as well as I would say a, a deep, um, normative and political disagreement. And for layman, uh, let's say AI actors, it's also hard to read through and keep up with all of that. So uh, not to mention that the majority of those initiatives are from Europe and North America. So you could say that there are limits to, to their values and their scope. Um, now, some of these guidelines and principles are built with the view that we should regulate, regulate the technology. And against this background, what is fair to emphasize um, is the critical need for speed. Uh, we're sort of playing a, 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 cat, a cat and mouse game. Um, so it takes time, but there's fierce competition out there and it's not waiting. Uh, if you look at the GDPR, which is the EU data protection law, as many of you will know, from the initial consultation to implementation, that whole process took a decade. And there's still issues in terms of interpretation and implementation uh, and resources. At the same time, the speed of change of technology, it sort of gives us little space or not enough space to ex explore any potential red flag. So we, we also need that time. Now, another point I wanted to bring up is that it's, it's easier for, for governments and, and, and companies to sign up to perhaps vague ethical principles than to enforce them. 
a lot of the ethical guidelines we're seeing have focused on um, what AI adoption focuses on, on defining what uh, AI adoption focuses on. There's a lack of, of focus on how to implement this in practice. And this, this frameworks introduce high level principles that by a sense are not always actionable. And AI development itself lacks proven methods to translate principles into practice. Um, another point is, well, if a country wants to lead in AI, it shouldn't just focus on values and ethics, of course, but also on performance and accuracy. And for that, you need to make sure companies focus their resources on hiring the best people, develop the best tools to improve the technology, uh, have access to the highest quality um, data as possible, um, because otherwise you can have massive consequences. Uh, Another point on the complexity of it uh, is, is to how to make concepts like ethics and fairness actionable and understandable for developers because of the multiple definitions and cultural perceptions of those concepts that exist and, and the different types of AI systems. And that co complexity transpires from the various guidelines produced here and there. Uh, there's this new report, and I'm happy to share the link in the chat later, which I come across, come across just today. Uh, by Plum Consulting, and it goes through, you know, how cultural differences play out in China and the US and Europe. In Europe, you have a strongly embedded culture of individual rights and uh, privacy rights uh, for centuries. Um, and in, in the US, you'd have more, you'd be navigating between the commitment to performance and to freedom. And in China, you have a culture of common good that makes private data a natural resource, say, of the digital economy. Uh, so, you know, th 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 let's not forget that linguistic cultural complexity that exists. Um, now, regarding bias and discrimination, which is strongly um, addressed uh, by ethical principles for AI, it's also interesting to think how those principles and values have evolved, like gender equality, race equality hasn't always been a value before, but we can steer AI agents towards the direction that our value systems are taking. So towards gender equality, for instance, or you know, against discrimination. But to achieve this, we need to have active, again, active AI research to make sure that AI catches up with our value. And the real question is, how do we put resources into it and where? And the final point to conclude, um, I think there are ways to think more creatively about how to ensure what Europeans call trustworthy AI, rather than just producing ethical guidelines only. And that includes having a population that doesn't fear the technology. And um, so for that to happen, you need to make sure you have a positive narrative, an opportunity-focused discussion around technology and enhance the digital literacy of the public, provide resources for them to feel empowered and to increase their capacity to understand the technology and, and, and of course, the implications. Um, thank you. I don't want to take up more time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Shivo, uh, uh, for your interventions. I'll now uh, give the floor to Ms. Yu Ping Chang, who is the Senior Program Officer in the Office of the Envoy on Technology at the United Nations. Uh, Ms. Yu Ping, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Soraya. And much thanks to the Baha'i International Community for inviting me here to speak today. I mean, I don't think I'll spend that much time going over some of the ground that my fellow panelists have talked about. The fact that AI really is a force that is present and ubiquitous in our lives today, from AI technologies being used in everything from commercial services, public services, and areas as diverse as education, healthcare, infrastructure, dating applications, and much more. I think as we move towards inhabiting more smarter cities, where AI will be using public data to identify efficient distribution of resources from transportation to utilities to waste management, I think our lives will be increasingly influenced by AI applications. And this is a truth that has become even more apparent to us given the COVID-19 pandemic, when we've really seen how the use of AI has been accelerated and, and accentuated in areas such as tracking the disease, predicting its evolution, vaccine research and development, and even the fact that we ourselves are now even more digital than ever before because of all the work and education and remote services that needs to go on, the use of AI technology, I think, will only grow. At the same time, I think that the pandemic has also highlighted how dependent we are on the predictive capabilities of AI. So for instance, while it allows us to better understand and cope with 
global phenomenon, it's shown unreliable in a lot of circumstances, making us vulnerable to systemic errors. We've also seen how, in addition to the ethical challenges that other panelists have talked about, AI can be used to manipulate consumers and voters to fuel polarization, as we've seen with Cambridge Analytica, and actually as documented, for instance, in our everyday lives by the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, which I really do recommend that some of you watch if you actually haven't seen it before. So again, AI technology, even though there is such great potential, also has such challenges as illustrated by Hamad and by Lean. And the very fact that there, it, there is that potential for unintentional misuse through discriminatory algorithms based on bias data that can then amplify unequal access to jobs and justice and finance, as Hamad had mentioned, and to Eileen's points about how there are other areas and ethical challenges when it comes to AI, there really is a need for us as an international community to consider what it, what the future of AI will bring and whether we need to come together to better address these challenges. I'm particularly struck by what Eileen says that as a result of the challenges of AI, we do see all these global efforts in place. We see, for instance, the OECD making an effort to better govern and a govern AI. We see multi-stakeholder partnerships such as uh, GPI, the Global Partnership on the Artificial Intelligence, coming together to try and address these concerns. But I think something that Eileen brought up and actually was mentioned in the chat as well is something that is really profound in all of these efforts around the international community to really grapple with the challenges of AI. The fact that the global South and that developing countries are not often part of these discussions around AI, its use and development. And that does lead to, for instance, as mentioned in the chat, the concern that algorithms are biased in a certain way, that they don't necessarily predict how behaviors behaviors or and then lead to inadvertent discrimination. So this is part of the reason why, for instance, we at the United Nations have been trying to take a more inclusive approach to artificial intelligence discussion. In the Office of the Technology Envoy, for instance, we are tasked with implementing the Secretary General's Roadmap on Digital Cooperation. This was a major report that was issued by the Secretary General last June, outlining his view on how the international community can come together around digital technologies, not just around the AI, but other areas of digital as well. So global connectivity, digital human rights, digital inclusion, and so forth. But a key cornerstone of his discussion on how the international community needs to better grapple with digital was AI, where he really flagged AI as an area where the international community, be it governments, civil society, stakeholder communities like yours, private sector really needs to come together to find a model of multi-stakeholder interaction, engagement, sharing of information and best practices so we can all collectively address the challenge of AI. He proposes in his roadmap for digital cooperation, a global multi-stakeholder advisory body on global AI cooperation that will in some ways hope to promote the use of AI in line with a lot of the principles that we've discussed just now. Lean mentioned, for instance, the need for trustworthy AI. This is something that is highlighted in the roadmap and is one of the areas in which we like to share information and provide strategic guidance as to how the international community can develop and use AI in a manner that is trustworthy, human rights-based, safe, sustainable, and promotes peace. So this will be part of the work of the United Nations going forward and is something that my office is now working on implementing and really engaging with all stakeholders to really bring about a, a, a work of the United Nations, a body of work at the United Nations that complements all these global efforts while ensuring that those at the table are truly representative and inclusive of all the countries around the world. So I really encourage colleagues who are thinking about that particular space of work to engage with my office and contribute to the UN's work to make sure that AI is fully representative and that our discussions too take into account the views of all. So I'll stop there and I'm open for questions and more interaction later. And again, my thanks to the Baha'i International Community for this very timely discussion on a key strategic challenge for all of us. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Yu Ping. Uh, I will now give the floor to our next speaker and final uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Douglas Allen, who is the Associate Professor of the Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver. Dr. Allen, you have the floor. Thank you, Soraya, and uh, thanks to the panelists for some wonderful uh, comments already to get us started. And thank you to the Baha'i International Community for hosting uh, the panel. The, the uh, topic of your paper that you've just released, Reflections of Our Values, Digital Technologies, and a Just Transition, uh, implies that there is an ethical consideration of the journey as well as the destination. And I think that that's an important thing uh, for us to have a look at. 
uh, as a, a, a professor of uh, business, uh, I've considered this issue in light of AI's impact on uh, work and, and its future. And uh, my colleague Cindy Fukami and Dennis Whitmer and I created a course at the Daniels College of Business entitled Robotics, AI, and the Future of Work to help our uh, both undergraduate and MBA students think about uh, their responsibility in the context of business as they help prepare their employees uh, for a future that will involve a combination of technologies and, uh, and thinking about how that can be moved towards the, the future. Our premise is that the future is not inevitable. Uh, it reflects the decisions that individuals, communities, businesses, societies, and governments make, and that the effectiveness of those decisions will depend on the quality of a consultative process that includes diverse uh, perspectives. And that does not mean simply diverse perspectives within one organization, but as uh, Yu Ping was uh, emphasizing, the entire world, including the global south, the global north, and everywhere in between. It will also depend on a willingness to, in part, to question prevailing assumptions about tech and business, which may have worked in an earlier age, but they may not be helpful as we navigate a digital uh, transition. Uh, some of those assumptions that we might want to question might include the market as driver of innovation and wealth, consumption as a key to economic strength, the relationship between work and income, distribution of resources, human nature itself. We'll need to be willing to reject false dichotomies such as prosperity versus sustainability, moving toward creative new ways of thinking that can embrace paradox as a norm. Uh, there's a great uncertainty and fear about how AI will impact the future of work. Uh, one study a few years ago suggested that half of all jobs will be impacted by AI and robotics in the next two decades. Others note that employment in developing countries are at particular risk because the cost of robotics and 3D printing are declining so quickly. Yuval Harari even warns of the creation of what he calls a useless class, quote unquote, of workers by 2050 as AI replaces workers in greater and greater numbers. Others point, however, towards the experience of the Industrial Revolution as assurance that new jobs will replace the old. 200 years ago, 80% uh, of jobs in the United States were in agriculture. 100 years later, that number was down by half to 40%. By 2000, the year 2000, it was 2% of uh, workers employed in agriculture. So new jobs had provided opportunity for employment and mass unemployment did not ensue. So the thinking sometimes goes that as AI replaces jobs, new jobs will follow. Probably true, but Fry in his book, The Technology Trap, warns us to take care in our analysis and directs our attention again to the transition. He says that most economists will acknowledge that technology progress can cause some adjustment problems in the short run. But then he notes what is rarely noted is that the short run can be a lifetime. Both the Industrial Revolution and the Computer Revolution primarily created jobs for another worker whose skills could not have been more different from those of the displaced worker. He further describes the pain and trauma that was imposed on masses of workers, their families and communities over many years as the Industrial Revolution slowly created a new set of jobs and a new working reality. While the benefit to future generations may not be in question, a just transition toward that future demands that we leave no one behind. A 2020 uh, MIT Future of Work report uh, suggests this. It says, ensuring that the benefits of the changes wrought by, uh, by AI are distributed widely across the workforce and across the globe will require a concerted effort to help people whose jobs are eliminated by facilitating the creation of new jobs matching jobs to job seekers and providing education, training, and sometimes financial support to people as they transition from old jobs to new ones. The New York Times also reports about early learning that we're gaining in this area. They refer to Sweden and they say that if you ask a union leader, are you afraid of new technology? They will answer, no, I'm afraid of old technology. The Swedish Minister for Employment and Integration states, the jobs disappear, and then we train people for new jobs. We won't protect jobs, but we will protect workers. I think that perspective is one that we may be able to learn from as we think about this transition. A vision for a digital, uh, uh, just digital future might include some of the following. AI and other tech leveraged for the betterment of humankind. Benefits of productivity widely shared, eliminating extremes of poverty and wealth. 
humans freed to take responsibility for their collective future. Technology offering a source of voice and inclusion for the many perspectives and cultures. Technology helping to build a sense of oneness of our global community. Technology might also help us rediscover the importance of community. Might humans learn that technology is not a replacement for community and actively work to restore the social fabric of community? Could collaboration replace competition as the driving force in society? As technology increases productivity and helps eliminate the perception of a zero sum world. The community itself could be recognized as a protagonist in the shaping of our future society with increasing empowerment and a sense of agency at the local level. Hamill and Zanini note in their book, Humanocracy, that the future of work and its availability is limited only by the imagination of those who design it. As they say, it is a thinking error to assume that the vast majority of jobs in an economy offer little scope for the application of the uniquely human capabilities that distinguish people from machines. While there may be a finite number of routine tasks to be performed in the world, there's no limit on the number of worthwhile problems that are begging to be solved. The threat that automation poses for automation depends mostly on whether or not we continue to treat employees like robots. Is it possible that fully engaged the generality of humankind collectively hold the key to a just transition to our digital future? As the Baha'i International Community suggests in their position paper, when all members of the human family are provided the opportunity to contribute to the betterment of the world and the full range of human capabilities express themselves in charting a meaningful life beyond solely materialistic considerations, true prosperity becomes possible. So thank you again to the Baha'i International Community and I look forward to a great conversation with our, my fellow panelists. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Allen. I'm sure if you're offering your course on robotics, AI, and the future of work online, I'm sure many of our attendees would be interested uh, in, in joining your, your course. Uh, perhaps I could, um, I'll, I'll ask the, the panelists if you have any uh, questions uh, of each other um, uh, about you know, the interventions that, that you all made before I, I open the floor. I see that there are a few questions from the attendees as well. If I may, I'm not sure if... Um, please, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I've, I've heard so many interesting things. It's hard to just uh, select to just one that could work. Um, but I, 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 I wanted to just, every time I hear um, about AI bias and discrimination and algorithmic bias, I think it's good to always mention that it is what it is. Algorithmic bias is actually what an algorithm uh, is supposed to do. If you look at it in a sense of, um, Statis the statistical definition of it, it's, uh, it's about the tendency of an algorithm to, to produce results that have differences in accuracy across different groups. So in that sense, some algorithmic bias can be acceptable and even sometimes desirable in some settings and in the marketplace. For instance, when you go online and, and shop for clothes, um, the engine recommends you clothes uh, for women if you're a woman or you know for men if you're a man. Um, so that they can have very positive um, uh, usage, um, but of course it's undesirable in many ways, especially when it comes to recommendations of, you know, job postings or you know all of the problems that you might have heard of that are typically headline grabbing and, uh, issues and that we should address because that's unacceptable. Uh, but it is complicated to address uh, bias in, in algorithms. Uh, you have a few tools, you have a few methods that exist that can help detect um, uh, biases in data before you use it. Help balancing out by adding or deleting identifying factors or sensitive variables like gender. Um, but it's sometimes not even enough to delete gender in an application um, because often there are variables related to one another. And, and uh, well, anyway, you know, proxy variables can still be there. There isn't a magic sauce for debiasing. Um, so I think there are a few practical steps that we, we should use to complement um, working on the data, like having responsible processes in companies that can mitigate bias. Uh, use various tools and different operational practices like the red teams or the, the third party audits, ensure diversity in teams uh, that create algorithms, but also beyond have multidisciplinary teams. Um, and, and of course, policies have a role in trying to open some data that can be shared so that companies have access to better data. That's really very much the, the key problem, I think, here. Uh, and to one point uh, that, I've, um, that I've heard um, 
uh, uh, that, that, that Dr. Allen mentioned about the jobs. I think, yeah, it's 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 a big um, fear, especially in Europe. I've looked at some surveys. You can see the biggest fear of Europeans when it comes to AI is the loss of jobs, and you know they have very negative view of the technology in general. What we should say, though, of course, I can show you a couple of studies that suggest AI will destroy jobs, but it will also create many of them. What we forget to say sometimes as well is that it will not necessarily replace humans. It will, you know, assist in some tasks because that's basically what AI can do right now. It's not to the stage that we can replace our intelligence. Um, and so tasks will change. Our jobs will change the way uh, the internet affected the way we work. And I think, I know I mentioned the, the importance of a positive narrative and I know, yeah, that is a bit easier said than done, but it's nevertheless very important so that people just want to embrace it and understand it and master the technology rather than fear it. Thank you very much. One, one, one of the concepts that reinforces Eileen's point uh, is uh, the concept of job enabling technology as opposed to job replacing. Uh, technology. And so uh, many people feel that uh, the, the goal should be less about computers versus workers and more about computers and workers and finding ways that uh, the workplace can be enhanced with what some people refer to as cobots, collaborative robots that are actually working side by side uh, with humans. And so there is a lot to be learned about how we can uh, redesign jobs to take advantage of these technologies without eliminating the employees themselves in the process. If, if you may allow me, um, uh, uh, sorry, I think comparing to technology and how it booms and how, how, how fast and rapid they are developing day by day, the challenging in, in policy, how policy will will be our can policy and, and, and rules and laws run together with, with technology and how can we, um, let's say, try at least to keep them closer. So what do you think about that, uh, Eleni? How, how can we, you know, create roles, uh, I mean, um, create uh, policies as fast as the technology. Ms. Chan, I see that you've unmuted yourself. Would you like to? to uh, my apologies. I'm still not learning after a year of uh, hard training on this. Um, so yeah, we there's there's something policies can policymakers can do and some things that designers can do. We all must go beyond ethical principles and labels and, and embed the ethics and privacy assessments, for instance, in the work. Uh, so, I mean, there's just starting with the basics, um, trying to respect the data protection laws in place. If you look at the corona apps that have been uh, rolled out across the world, that was a fascinating an interesting case study of how trust can make or break a, a sensitive, uh, a sensible solution. Um, I think you need, um, you know, a structure um, that exists. Uh, I was talking about high quality data sets. You can have open data strategies and policies in Europe. They've, they're, they're working on this data governance, data strategy to uh, open more public sector data to businesses so that they get, you know, better quality data because public sector has throws of data in many, many countries and many, many governments. Uh, I think, as mentioned, you can have audit mechanisms and collaborative means with multi-stakeholder engagement within teams, within companies. Uh, some uh, commissioners in the EU proposed ethical guidelines for social media algorithms. So you'd have uh, some sort of a mindful coding kind of system um, that would encourage companies to take a more responsible approach, a bit like an architect does when you focus on safety and functionality when building uh, buildings to, to, you know, and homes for people. Um, and I think incentives for companies to invest in that type of research, like um, on bias, uh, technical methods to, to de-bias, um, you know, correct data, hiring better people, I think you really need to incentivize them uh, with policies that support them, rather than adding more red tape. Sometimes we want to regulate too quickly. Uh, as mentioned, it's hard because technology moves fast, so you really need to make sure that whatever you produce can be used and ready, readily used by developers. The 
commission published an assessment list, just briefly to finish on that, an assessment list for trustworthy AI, uh, which is a list of actions and questions, a checklist that's available, uh, freely accessible. Uh, so for instance, could the AI system and building affect human and autonomy by generating over-reliance by end users? Did you take measures to minimize the risk of addiction is another? So you have a few, uh, a few of that so that developers can assess compliance with privacy data governance and, and a lot of principles that uh, they've lined up. I don't want to speak too much, but I hope that addresses your question. If I could just come in and sort of ask a question, I guess this perhaps is to Hamad and Amin. I mean, we're particularly at the UN struck by the fact that the UAE was the first country in the world to ever have a minister for artificial intelligence. And for us, that is, you're right, quite revolutionary. And that to us, it's a little bit connected to the question that you asked, Eileen. This question of the pacing problem between regulators and national governments and technology as well as tech companies. Because in a lot of cases, and this is not just for AI, but across all tech as well, we see that it is companies that are making the decisions as to how to address some of the challenges when it comes to the use of the new technologies. So how are governments then sort of addressing this pacing problem where you try to stay ahead of the technology, ahead of the tech companies in a way that policy is meaningful and impactful? And Connected to that, and this is perhaps a question for all the panelists and perhaps also participants on this call, what role do you think the United Nations can play in sort of filling that space and supporting countries as well as making sure that there is engagement of tech companies and civil society and so forth in this perennial struggle to keep up with the technology? Well, that's a really difficult question, but uh, let me answer for uh, for United Arab Emirates. We do have a great uh, leadership and, and vision, I think, and by introducing the first artificial intelligence ministry in United Arab Emirates, it encourages everyone and put high KPIs in all ministries and, um, and services that are provided to the citizen uh, in UAE. Uh, plus also encouraging uh, ministries to work with the Ministry of Artificial Intelligence, uh, obeying to to their uh, to to their laws, uh, contributing and putting uh, policy with the government, and also involving uh, private sector. So I think we have a, a great mix between um, uh, government leading and uh, private sector uh, contributing to that. Wonderful, thank you. Maybe I can uh, take a question from one of our attendees who will take the floor, uh, unless uh, Dr. Allen, if you have anything else uh, to add to this very rich conversation before we, we go on to, to Winifred who has a question. Please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you very much uh, for this informative um, discussion around the ethical use of AI. Uh, for myself personally, I feel I have journeyed into an alternative universe, uh, given the level of discussion. Uh, and I very much appreciate uh, the concern around the ethical use. But I, I want to uh, kind of ask the question, how can all of this learning be made available to the people in my organization? And I'm a Good Shepherd sister, uh, and we are present in 72 countries throughout the world working at the grassroots. And like my personal experience uh, of the abuses of this new moment of technology doesn't just start today or yesterday. It goes back the years uh, in terms of the trafficking of women and girls from the very vulnerable, rural, poverty-stricken areas of the world to the richer uh, destinations. Uh, and more recently then, uh, the whole exploitation of uh, children uh, in terms of online uh, grooming and um, uh, abuse. And I'm very happy to hear uh, Mr. Hamid uh, talk about a, a program that helps with uh, addressing this issue. Uh, but I, the bringing the information to the grassroots, 
and empowering the, the marginalized communities must also be a factor, I, I think, as we talk about this, um, uh, this uh, huge development that is outpacing us. And, and that's why I kind of say we're trying to keep up. But there are people I try to keep up, but the people that I represent are totally outside of this universe and yet are abused by it. Uh, so my question is, how can we address that gap? Thank you very much and congratulations to everybody uh, and to the Baha'i community for having this kind of uh, moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear panelists. Um, I'm happy to jump in briefly. Thank you, Winifred, for uh, your generosity and your and your questions. Uh, I think that's really the <laughs> it's the crux of the matter because we can again think high level and have all these rules and, and ethical frameworks and conversation in place, but how do they materialize and how do they reach the actual populations and how to engage people in it? I've seen a question from a participant that sort of is about this. How do you you know, make sure that people are educated and empowered uh, when it comes to that technology. I don't have the answer except the usual one, which no one takes seriously. Unfortunately, it's sometimes, I think to me, the only real viable long-term answer and also in the face of misinformation, uh, as we heard before, um, uh, Mr. Katir referred to it, uh, it's education uh, and it's um, having campaigns uh, from the government to its people uh, in, in, including uh, courses on data and AI that we've seen with, with the elements of AI in Finland uh, to be made available freely. Um, and of course, it's on the internet, so you still exclude a part of the population. But little by little, we might be able to integrate those courses in schools at all levels. We could have governments reach out more and talk more about the technology. There's really a gap between what I see in Brussels and among policymakers and you know, actually my own family who never hears about those technologies are very, you know, not, not enough, uh, not often enough. Uh, so yeah, for me, the answer is education and bridging the gap, uh, the social gap. And when you have the recovery plans, for instance, in different countries after the pandemic, we should not forget that if you don't address, you don't use the funds to address inequalities of all kinds, then, you know, you can have all the technology that you want and all the innovation that you want, but you'll, you'll leave people behind. Dr. Allen, please. Uh, yes, I, I would totally agree with the comments of Aline that <clears throat> the long-term solution is, is uh, education, but I think there's more to it than that. Uh, uh, Tom Friedman, the author of a well-known book called The World is Flat, wrote another book called Thank You for uh, Being Late. And uh, in that book, he uh, provided a curve that was quite interesting, comparing rate of change. And, and of course, the rate of change that was just taking almost straight off was the technological change. And lagging behind quite a ways on the chart was the ability of uh, people, uh, humans, to keep up. And lagging further behind that were the ability of organizations to keep up. And lagging in last place were the ability of governments and policymakers to keep up. <clears throat> and so he kind of showed these gaps that were there. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, one of the fundamental assumptions we may need to question is whether technology should be setting the pace for the world. Uh, right now, that is what happens because as companies compete with each other and various kinds of developers are working on things, their objective is always to be one step ahead of the other in a competitive mode. And therefore the technology races ahead and oftentimes outpaces everybody else. Uh, it seems to me that either we have to learn how to keep up with technology or maybe we have to actually create some kind of dial that can allow some pacing of that technology. Uh, Japan did that uh, in the 1980s when their auto companies were uh, uh, unveiling new models so quickly, it was unsustainable as a business model. And so they said, uh, every four years is the uh, shortest cycle time for your new vehicle, vehicle. If you introduce a new generation of a vehicle in four years, the next one is four years later. Uh, maybe there needs to be some regulation that actually uh, helps kind of dial down that pace a little bit so that society and its uh, stakeholders can uh, keep up. 
the other thing though is regulation. I, I think that regulation really has to be stepping in and there's an interesting relationship uh, between uh, regulation and uh, the companies as protagonists. It seems to me that the more responsible companies are, the less need there is for regulation. And the more irresponsible they uh, behave, the more need there is for regulation. And then uh, fair enough, the regulation has to step in. So if everybody is playing their part to take responsibility for keeping up with this change, including perhaps controlling how quickly the change is introduced, it becomes possible then to begin addressing these issues in a more coherent fashion. I just want to come back to two things I think that other panelists and Winifred had raised. I do think that, you know, to be very honest, Winifred, I, I don't think it's the case that all of us are that much more learned about the technology than you are. And I do think that, in fact, at the UN, there is a paucity of information and understanding about these new technologies. And that's part of the challenge that we're facing across the last one, two, three years, that especially because it's such a, a rapidly evolving field that requires actually understanding and awareness, but then some form of engagement, we are all struggling to play this kind of catch up. So I don't necessarily know that's just you. I do think it's all of us and something that we face across the board. I would also say that, as Eileen said, I do think education is part of that solution, but I also think that it also is concerned communities making the links between technologies and your various areas of work and issues. So for instance, when you raise trafficking, I do think that there is that scope, for instance, for your organization or other organizations to look at how AI applies to that particular area and perhaps put forward a conversation or a policy paper or some thinking around that particular area. Because especially since this technology is so new, there is that sense in which it is not well understood and its implications across the board are not really considered, particularly from the perspective of individuals or organizations that are concerned about its implications in certain areas. I think there is a tendency and assumption to see AI as a very sort of technical, highfalutin area that's only for technical experts. And hence, there is not the engagement that we do desperately need of, of organizations like yourself thinking about what are the real world implications. Because as we talked about before, it is not that AI technology is only sort of clustered or like centered in certain very esoteric areas of the industry, it is pervasive. And in the very technology that we use on an everyday basis, our devices and so forth. So I do think that sort of unpacking these implications from across the board, involving all stakeholders, even organizations that perhaps see themselves as not really directly related to the AI work is important. And I would encourage this kind of activism around the United Nations community. And I really applaud this conversation that's been organized by the Baha'i international community for bringing this for starting this type of discussion as to what are the cross connections between these types of technologies, AI and so forth, and issues such as trafficking. I will also say, and on a sort of separate point, what, um, what has just been raised perhaps about this issue of regulation is actually another conundrum that we're facing here. So as Dr. Allen said, you know, this question about what is the proper role of regulation? Something that we've been pushing up against at the United Nations is this assumption that I think another colleague had spoken about just now, that there is this assumption that regulation automatically is at odds with innovation. And that there is this trade-off that when there is regulation of the technological fields of technology companies and so forth, we stifle innovation. But I think Dr. Allen has pointed out how there can be a mix between the two and that there is in some ways a ability to talk about good regulation, be it in the form of this pacing example that he, that he just gave about the Japanese companies, and find some way of having a balance in the way we look at these technologies. I mean, the very fact that we are discussing, for instance, how we respond to social media companies in the wake of what happened in the US in January, for instance, is that question of the pacing conundrum that's really we're confronting as regulators and as policymakers. And so, Again, how we interact in this particular space where we don't necessarily see regulation at odds with innovation, but really start turning the conversation to what kind of regulation is good, what kind of regulation do we need, rather than seeing it as a zero sum game, I think is an important part of the conversation. Finally, I just want to talk very quickly about a question that I see in the chat from Daniel Truran about this idea of the innovation investment in AI being clustered among a relatively small group of people or organizations. I think that's precisely why the UN is sort of offering itself as a platform to have a more inclusive conversation around AI and not just around AI. You mentioned, for instance, this issue of fast tracking internet access across the world. There is a whole separate strand of work that's being pushed forward in the United Nations as part of the roadmap on achieving universal connectivity for all by 2030. And this really is looking at connecting the 3.6 billion people in the world that still don't have access to the internet. Because like I said, it's not that AI is highfalutin and so forth, but we really also need to talk about the basic access to digital technologies that then allows everyone around the world to have access to these 
benefits of the technology, as well as addressing the challenges that come from them. Ms. Chivo, I see that you've uh, unmuted yourself. Please go ahead. Oh, I probably forgot to mute myself to start with, but um, uh, I don't know. I, I feel I've spoken a lot, but I have, I have, I have seen a, a, a question from a participant in the chat about China. Uh, and I think it was uh, whether there's a concern that China is leading the development of AI or if it's something that we should see as an advantage. And I think it's, it's worth bringing up this point um, briefly. I, I know we don't have much time left, but um, like I said, I, I, there's a survey that suggests in Europe, um, a bit more than 40% 40, 40 of Europeans see that uh, AI is, is worrying people. And in China, 59% of people actually see it as helpful. So you have that enthusiasm, you know, they use more mobile payments than us have this access to this huge data set, which is their population, basically. Uh, and it has long been perceived as a country that does not focus on AI principles. But in recent years, they've shown a will to discuss and rethink how to use the technology, at least in principles. They've launched uh, AI governance and ethics initiatives. So I think we shouldn't, um, I mean, it, it may be seen as uh, disingenuous or, or paradoxical because you know that it's not seen as a defender of, of civil liberties and freedom and the application of certain technologies like facial recognition raises significant concerns about how this can enable repressive surveillance and human rights abuses. Um, so there's discomfort around how the technology is actually being deployed and used in China and how that doesn't align with our democratic values, but also how China is really not kidding around with catching up with the West and leading the world in technology. And that really raises big concerns in Europe, and especially the US, because we see ourselves and our infrastructure as increasingly vulnerable. Uh, now, of course, it's difficult as well in the world, in a world economy that's so interdependent to say, we don't want to deal with that country or that country. I think, like the EU said, it's a, it's a systemic rival of China, but it's also a partner in some way, and we should encourage their, you know, commitment to some principles that we can agree with, but we should really be careful not to get sidetracked and really know that they are willing to leap over our economies uh, when it comes to mastering the technology. And in that respect, if you decide to not develop certain technologies like banning facial recognition technology, we, we will have no, not, no time to talk about it further, so very briefly, I would say it's better if we can experiment it and develop it even in like test beds and labs so that we don't cede that market to other countries that might use those technologies and develop them with principles that we don't agree with or might not align with ours. So I'll leave it to that. Um, just. Thank you very much. We now have a question uh, from one of our attendees and colleagues, uh, Jeff Simon, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, dear friends, dear panelists, uh, also to the sister office in New York for organizing this, this wonderful event. Uh, I was thinking I was sharing actually the question also in the chat, and it's basically about the design of AI. And it's something that also we have seen in the spaces in, in, in Europe is actually how do you involve uh, local communities into the process of building, creating artificial intelligence? And uh, I think uh, Elin Shivo, she, she talked about mindful coding and I just asked myself, how can you develop new forms of collective agency, basically where you know, software programmers on the one hand and then also communities on the other hand can sit together and reflect about what are the algorithms that we want to build? How can we reach the social reality on the ground and the needs that we have so that we really cater those needs and, and, and answer them? And then maybe on the other hand, um, something <clears throat> that was uh, mentioned, uh, the Social Dilemma do documentary. Um, and, and one of their, the main figures behind the documentary is uh, Sam Harris uh, from the Center of Humane Technology. And he said in one um, podcast, very strikingly, that one of the capacities that humanity has is self-awareness and the capacity to reflect. And I think when it comes to, to our technology, I think really this capacity to reflect has each and every one of us, and, and especially when it comes to design of AI. And I just want to ask the, 
the panelists, how they think, how can we develop with that technology, new forms of collective agency on one hand, but also this, this approach of mindful coding and, and ethical frameworks. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And also to, to address one of the questions uh, that came up in our Q&A that, that is uh, in line with the question that, that Jeff um, just shared with, with us is a question from Matt Weinberg. Um, and I'll, I'll read that so that our panelists can answer maybe both, both together in the interest of time. So Matt Weinberg has asked, in the end, it is human beings who determine how technologies are developed and applied. Disseminating technology is easy, nurturing human capacity, institutions, and consultative mechanisms that put it to good use is the crux. In this regard, what forms of rigorous and inclusive mechanisms of technological assessment are in place in the EU, UAE, the UN, et cetera? Do they involve all stakeholders, civil society, business, academia, government, and as Jeff mentioned, also at the grassroots? We have two uh, panelists. Maybe, um, Hamad, if you'd like to go first, and then Ms. Um, Shiva. Well, um, I think inclusivity is, is must in, in, in designing any, any software, uh, taking in mind all, all type of people, let's say from gender, um, 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 uh, nationality, uh, age, you're supposed to, to, to involve everyone on the design process. And it's not only design process, it's from design process to, uh, to, uh, to developing process and testing as well. So they, they need to be involved in all the process of, uh, of putting this algorithm and software. This would minimize any, any issues that might come in the end, in the, in the end product or, or result that we are looking to build. So it's not only putting them in the design, but design and developing and also on testing and make sure that we meet all expectation of the of uh, end users i'm happy to react but i i don't want to take up any like too much extra time or am i allowed to <laughs> Please go, go ahead and then I can, I can turn to one of the, the other questions in, in the Q&A as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much, Jeff, for your, your questions. Um, of course, we won't uh, be able to give you an answer tonight, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, be, I believe what, for instance, the Europe has done and, and perhaps other countries and, and uh, the uh, UAE has done as well. I think at, at each level, there's been consultation with many stakeholders. Uh, I know that the uh, Commission has done that extensively with industry, with civil society. Uh, you can see the public consultation. They had feedback published, and actually, a lot of individuals, not just organizations, have made time to react and respond and, and talk about how they feel about those ethical principles. I think the idea of principles rather than strict rules that may be difficult for all to understand is that it gives flexibility uh, to apply a code that we can all agree on, uh, that we collectively adhere to, that's sort of a moral compass, let's say. Uh, I mentioned a few tricks and techniques that developers themselves can use, you know, to, to, to work on their data sets, but also if it comes down to a broader set of people, it's up to organizations also to hire more you know, people with multidisciplinary background that are not necessarily don't necessarily have a, a background in, in tech. Um, and just one thing I'd like to put out there that I was thinking about it when, I, when I listened to a related podcast, there are important questions that relate to the raison d'être of an organization, you know, someone that works in an organization, say, as a data scientist. Regulations that are well thought through can make organizations happier to comply and follow guidelines. The question, though, is for many is, where the primary allegiance lies. Is it to the company? Is it to society and mankind or the other way around? Now, employees do identify with their companies, their families and their relatives and maybe the whole world and humanity, but that is not an obvious commitment. Um, so I think, yeah, that's just a question that I was asking myself on that. But um, I'm, I don't think I've answered your question, Jeff, though. <laughs> Dr. Allen, please. 
Uh, <clears throat> I, I would just like to add that uh, this notion of expanding the range of qualifications that we consider to be useful to contribute is a very important part of that inclusiveness in the design. Uh, historically, we've said, okay, this needs to be a coder or a programmer or something like that to be able to design the uh, algorithms or whatever it is. But what we need to realize that we is we need a wide range of skills. We need the perspective of the woman in the village or the child in the school, uh, the end users and the individuals who will be impacted by these technologies, not just the people who are capable of developing uh, the technologies. And so one of the analogies in my mind is that uh, in the computer age in the 80s, 90s and you know, 2000s, uh, in most corporations, you had a CIO and then that CIO and his or her department served the various managers and employees in the organization as customers. We, we now have to, without insisting on high level STEM skill, skills, let's say, uh, find ways to uh, empower uh, these individuals throughout the organization to be partners with the technologists so that there's an equal voice and equal sharing as the policies and the usages and the designs are created that really accommodate and uh, acknowledge the needs of the generality of, of humankind. Thank you. We also have a, a, a wonderful uh, comment here in the in the chat box from, from Daniel Truran, who says, how can, I'm, I'm just abbreviating here, but it says, how can we excite the AI strategists to compete for something so powerful as creating the best AI and tech for the world? I really think that regulation will always fall behind the innovation, but if we create a sense of excitement and positive innovation that taps into the innate human nobility of human beings, that might create a positive competition that can drive the best possible change, perhaps. And uh, there's also another question in the Q&A. &A. I know that we don't have so much time, so maybe I'll, I'll ask this question uh, as well. It's a question from Thane. Uh, and the question is, AI is described as a tool of the future, but its intelligence is based on the analysis of past events. How can we make it a tool for social progress when its learning is based on past events? Dr. Allen? I think that's an excellent question. It goes back to the issue of bias that we were talking about earlier. One of the greatest sources of bias in these algorithms is that it is learning from data that was generated by past biased decisions that were made in organizations and, and society in, in any number of different ways. And so the algorithms are only as good as the data that it learns from. I think one of the really big challenges is to future orient the algorithms rather than orient them towards the past. Uh, I've heard some people say one of the advantages of using these algorithms is it takes human bias out of the equation. That's just absolutely oftentimes not the case because the algorithms have learned from past human decisions. What we need to do is recognize, first of all, the limitations of those algorithms and then use them appropriately. For instance, as a selection tool in organizations, uh, we could use those algorithms to radar scan thousands of possible people uh, and bring in, in an inclusive way, uh, individuals from a variety of backgrounds that would not have appeared on our radar screen had we simply used our own networking skills to identify a few people. But when we then apply those algorithms to deciding to select someone, unfortunately, a lot of those biases come in uh, and get applied in, in negative ways. So it, it seems to me that one of the frontiers of AI is to figure out how we can forward orient these algorithms rather than backward orient them. Can I just add to that that um, it's it's an interesting um, uh, discussion again. Uh, you know the bias in, in artificial intelligence. If you look at uh, the study, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the U.S. They they're doing this test for facial recognition systems and technologies every year. And what you saw in the press coming out based on this report was 90% uh, of FRT systems biased. But the actual result, if you would dig into this report a little bit further, would show that 
There are 10% of the systems that work extremely well and are super accurate, including taking into account diversity of people and such. So I would say is don't buy those 90% systems, buy the 10%. Uh, it's like as if you would buy a car that, you know, you know, you've seen bad reviews or, you know, you know, it's not recommended to buy that car. So I think it's also a matter of choosing the right system. I don't mean to say that the technology itself shouldn't be improved. No, no, no. On the contrary, or it should maybe we should use it carefully. We should actually have strict rules around it for sure, for clarity as well. But, you know, what happened with the UK algorithm uh, for um, students, I think there was a big issue that it recommended the wrong things to students. I no longer remember the name, but there was a big thing in the summer and everyone said, well, don't use the technology. And I was thinking, yes, but you could also go to the government and say, why did you pick up this one? How did you test it? Did you actually test it? Did you? And there's also, back to your point, uh, Dr. Allen, there's, there's a lot of ongoing discussions between AI researchers, as you know, they don't agree on, uh, on, on bias and where it comes from. Uh, Jan Lequin of Facebook, he, he uh, is an AI researcher there, he said the machine learning systems are biased when data is biased, but for Timnit uh, Gebrut, who was actually recently, uh, uh, she recently quit or was fired from Google, but she was part of the ethical AI team there. She, she criticized that framing of the problem because for her, fairness is not just about data sets. It's not just about math, it's about society, it's about engineers, scientists, you know, we can't shy away from that. Uh, so it's difficult because, you know, even AI researchers that are super reputed don't even agree on, on what the root cause is. Uh, so. Thank you, Ms. Shivo. Perhaps I know that uh, we are tight on time. Perhaps I can I can open the floor to the panelists for any final remarks um, before we we end uh, quite an enriching, uh, very rich conversation that that we've had already this uh, this afternoon. I mean, I'll kick off just by saying that really it's been really an illuminating and very interesting discussion, and I really hope that this is part of this overall dialogue here at the United Nations about digital technologies and the implications of that and reflections among all of stakeholders, governments, civil society, organizations, technical companies as to what it means to really address the online future in the digital space. I would like to thank um, uh, Baha'i International Com uh, Community for, uh, for hosting us today. And I wish uh, we can meet uh, maybe in, in uh, five or six years and we see the, the world better with, uh, with artificial intelligence and we have greater uh, solutions and applications. Well, yeah, uh, thank you so much to the Baha'i International Community again, and thank you to all the participants because you all have, ve you had very interesting questions and I see there's a strong reflection from one of you. So uh, I, I'm, I feel that we should have uh, had more time to address all of that. I think AI is a global challenge and AI ethics is a global challenge. So we've said many times, we need multidisciplinary engagement, multi-stakeholder uh, engagement, and sometimes these sound like vain words, but it takes time. Uh, I think also the choice is ours very much to make sure that AI can improve our lives. Uh, you know, it should be the aim of technological advantage, um, advances. Um, so um, we should keep on asking ourselves, who is it for? How can we help people? How can we make it accessible to everyone? Some things can't work in the real world. So you'd want to make sure the technology works when it's out there. Um, yeah, and I, I think I'll just stop there and I'm just looking forward to the next discussion. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you very much. I, I would just add my thanks to the panelists for some fantastic uh, observations and perspectives and to the Baha'i International community for organizing uh, the, this event. I, th I think one of the takeaways from for me today is the importance of real-time watchfulness for adverse impact. So that instead of simply saying there'll be some things that happen along the way, we're ready to actually pivot and adjust quickly 
uh, so that we don't continue that impact when it occurs, but we also correct that impact so that it has not uh, impacted people in a negative way uh, unnecessarily. Uh, at the same time, we need to be sure not to fear change and the possibility of uh, mistakes along the way. It, it'll only be through trial and error learning uh, that we can advance and make these uh, very valuable technologies available to the generality of humankind. So we've got to find that balance where we can be sure that we uh, avoid the adverse impact that we've been talking about in part today, but also make sure that we take full advantage of the promise and potential that these technologies offer because that's part of our ethical responsibility as well. Thank you again. I want to, to thank our, our distinguished panelists again today for their wonderful interventions on quite an exciting topic. Um, I know that I just want to close with me. We know that AI holds a, a great potential to channel the, the human spirit to address humanity's most pressing challenges, but that that potential can only be truly released when such technologies reflect the full diversity of perspectives and values among the peoples of the world. Um, again, thank you to, to all our, our attendees and to, to, to our panelists. I know that my colleague, uh, Daniel Perel from the BIC has um, put in the, in the chat box uh, our most recent statement, um, which, uh, which should be there, I believe. And also, of course, feel free to offer any thoughts and feedback. Uh, and if you'd like to continue continue this conversation, we also have uh, an email address uh, in, in the chat box. But again, thank you, thank you to everyone. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, this recording will also be uh, on the will also be webcast and will be available online. And I believe my colleagues have put the link in the chat box on where to find it. So thank you again to, to our panelists and it was wonderful having you uh, all here with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for hosting. It was great. Thank you. Thanks again.